Hello everyone, uh, I hope you're uh, doing well. So uh, that's the first for me uh, today uh, with this uh, second uh, online uh, series of uh, Startup and Angels. And I'm glad to uh, have you all today uh, online. Uh, due to the situation, obviously, we had to adapt uh, our events and uh, manage it uh, fully online now. But uh, it's great to have you all uh, online. You've been a bit uh, less than 100 to uh, register and you're already more than 40 now uh, online. So thanks again uh, for coming today. Uh, of course, obviously, we are all uh, in uh, our own uh, place and it's a bit uh, different. No time to network with a glass of uh, wine or a, a nice beer, but we'll do it definitely soon. Um, so thanks again for uh, joining us today. And today I'm uh, glad to have uh, three speakers about uh, so, um, uh, three investors uh, about uh, startups, uh, investing, etc., and to give some uh, advice during this uh, strange uh, times and situation. Uh, please welcome uh, so Albert Bielinko from uh, Testra Ventures based in Sydney, uh, Michael Blakey from uh, Cocoon Capital in uh, Singapore, and uh, Robert William from uh, Artesian in Sydney as well. Uh, and just to give you a quick um, update as well on, uh, on, the, on the situation uh, with the Startup and Angels. So we've just launched our uh, online community. I just move a bit through the slides. So we just move, uh, launched our online community that you can uh, register in here, Startups and Angels. Uh, ramenlive.co uh, so you can network uh, with uh, other attendees uh, members ask questions share wins uh, post jobs share uh, things about your uh, startups uh, or your uh, businesses as well so feel free to register it's free uh, and then you can attend those uh, online events uh, for free uh, startup and angel if you don't know so we've been uh, around for about uh, more than uh, three years had a uh, few thousand attendees hundreds of speakers and startups presenting the goal was initially to uh, uh, gather uh, startups and uh, uh, angels or uh, investors or members of the ecosystem together in a nice informal event so today it's definitely informal and we are all uh, from uh, our own bedrooms um, more than 40 editions around the world in more than uh, 12 countries uh, so it's been, it's been a great um, time doing this over the last three years this event is powered by uh, australians which is uh, founded by uh, my uh, startup and angels co-founder uh, leo dennis so you can learn more about it on uh, australians.com and uh, without further ado so i will uh, invite uh, the three uh, speakers today so um, to um, explain a bit more about uh, who they are, what they are doing, uh, etc., and then we'll move on with questions. Don't hesitate to uh, ask questions on the chat. There is as well a dedicated Q&A window you can open on Zoom to ask questions. Uh, that's it. So um, let's move on with uh, Albert first. Albert, uh, thanks for joining. Hi everyone, really great to be here. So uh, just to introduce myself, so I'm an investor at Telstra Ventures. Uh, so we at Telstra Ventures have invested more than 450 mil um, USD in 67 technology businesses in the last nine years. Um, we've been fortunate to partner with some really great companies like DocuSign, Box, CrowdStrike, um, GitLab, Alt0 and, and others. Um, we're quite focused on software differentiated businesses with large markets and phenomenal founders. So they're kind of the things we, we really look for. Um, we're especially driven by the potential size of an opportunity. So um, due to the, the size of our fund, we are seeking companies that, that can become really big outcomes if, if things go really well. Um, one of the differentiators for us is that we are structured as a general partner, limited partner fund, which means that we are independent to Telstra. Um, we're a financial investor and we do actually have third party institutional capital uh, from Harbourvest, which is a fund of funds and two, uh, two super funds and then each of us internally as well. Uh, so what that means is that Telstra is an investor in the fund, but we're a financial investor and we do a lot of work to try to bring the benefits of the Telstra relationship to the founders that we partner with. Um, and if they are interested, we help them sell into Telstra and sell through Telstra. And those efforts so far have generated 270 million US dollars of revenue for the portfolio companies. Uh, typically, we're writing four to 12 mil checks per deal. So look forward to, to uh, 
talking more through the situation we're in. Thanks, Albert. Uh, so uh, please welcome uh, Michael from uh, Cocoon Capital, uh, live from uh, Space and Singapore. Uh, hi there. Uh, thank you very much for having us and for organizing this. Uh, my brief on my background is um, I've been an early stage investor for the last 20 years. Um, moved out, uh, from, started in the US, then the UK, and then moved out uh, to Singapore um, in 2013. Uh, our folk, uh, I, I co-founded a Cocoon Capital um, a few years back, which is an early stage uh, seed fund uh, based in Singapore that covers um, Asia, most, uh, mostly focused on Southeast Asia. Uh, we focus on deep tech and enterprise tech, and we're normally the first uh, money in. So most of the time we're investing in uh, pre-revenue, sometimes even pre-product companies. Uh, our check size is anything up to a uh, million dollars, um, you know, and we're what I would call, say, very active investors. So we work very closely. So we can only do a maximum of six deals a year. And we work very closely with the founders um, who are mostly first time founders to actually get them over the hump. Um, I, I co-founded this with uh, a, a guy called Will Clipkin. Um, who is also a successful entrepreneur and investor for the last uh, 25 years. Um, and, you know, our success rate has been about 75% um, over the last uh, 20 years. So we original investors into uh, companies like Property Guru, Ixago, um, and the stuff. So Will in particular has been here since 2003 investing. So, um, uh, and we work with, you know, supporting the companies, not just the normal fundraising, um, but also personal development of founders um, and BD and a lot of other getting corporate governance set in to help support them for the future. Thank you, uh, Michael. Uh, and uh, please welcome uh, Robert from uh, Artesian, uh, based in uh, Sydney as well. Hi, Robert. Thanks very much, Axel. Um, th thanks for the invitation to participate and for organizing the event today. Um, so Robert Williams from Artesian based in Sydney. Um, so Artesian is uh, an early and, and late stage uh, VC investor with a presence um, across broader Asia Pacific. Um, we, we work with a, a variety of uh, partners and investors from uh, more traditional uh, financial investors like uh, super funds, high net worth, family offices. Uh, but also uh, have a relationship with industry and corporate um, investors as well who all have different, um, different objectives with regards to um, early and late stage uh, VC. Um, Artesian's managing around uh, 400 mil uh, in funds under management. We have uh, over 400 portfolio companies now um, across our various funds. Uh, while we have... Uh, the ability to invest agnostically, uh, and we do, we have uh, started to focus on three themes of verticals in particular that comprise an overweight across our portfolios. Those include agri-food, uh, clean energy, and medical technology. Um, in my personal uh, you know, capacity with Artesian, I focus on the, the agri-food um, side of the portfolio. Uh, and uh, previously have a background um, across you know, broader um, institutional agricultural investment uh, through my prior uh, role at uh, Macquarie Group in Sydney. Thanks. Um, thanks, guys, for uh, the intro. So uh, let's start first uh, with you, uh, Robert. Uh, what's your, um, yeah, your view uh, on the current uh, situation personally and, uh, of course, with uh, Artesian? Sure. Thanks. Thanks, Axel. So I, I guess, um, you know, at, at risk of stating the obvious, you know, this, this event has had a huge, you know, global financial markets, uh, so equities and fixed income, but also private markets as well. And I think, um, you know, a, a key reason uh, for that is that, you know, markets across the board, have struggled to you know, price um, the pandemic risk that's presented. And I think um, you know, considering that, it, it really is probably the first time that, that global markets have had to do that at, at this magnitude, you know, now that we're in a, a global um, and digitally connected you know, financial marketplace. 
So I think, um, you know, I think obviously, uh, you know, significant and unique, I guess the second broad comment um, is that, you know, we see this situation as quite different from, you know, the last major uh, global financial event being the GFC um, in that, you know, where the GFC was really driven uh, through, you know, financial markets, Wall Street, um, liquidity. This event is a, is a mainstream event um, and thus, you know, has, has different uh, drivers and consequences. And, you know, I think, um, you know, that, that makes it challenging to determine, you know, what the, the potential impacts can be over the, the short to medium term, as, as I guess we're seeing live how um, stimulus and, and government industry support pieces are, are playing out. So I guess with, with that in mind, you know, there are new challenges and opportunities um, presented to both VCs and investors. Um, and I think we're going to cover, you know, some of the, um, the changes to the, the funding environment sort of later in the discussion. Um, but, you know, I think, I think generally um, VCs, you know, starting to uh, consider, you know, perhaps less of a focus on growth at any cost um, and starting to, you know, refocus, um, you know, analysis uh, and, and scouting on sustainability and, and profitability. Um, I think, you know, there's a contemplation of now investing, you know, earlier along the stage scale um, as new technologies and models um, addressing, you know, post COVID-19 uh, issues begin to emerge. Um, and I think, you know, probably a focus on rationalizing uh, pipelines and, and really looking to, you know, target opportunities that are core to particular mandates, um, which, which could represent, um, you know, perhaps a, a move away from, you know, some more adjacent type um, opportunities that previously, you know, could have been considered. Um, and then I think just taking a step back, you know, looking at the general, you know, investor landscape, um, you know, considering um, other, other participants outside of VC, you know, I think immediately, you know, a real focus on greater diversification, you know, within portfolios, um, which, you know, which, which, will, which will play out. Um, I think we're seeing, you know, uh, a refocus on geographies in terms of, uh, you know, broader investors looking to identify, you know, where uh, opportunities exist, you know, which, which may look different to, to uh, where the focus has been, you know, over the, the, you know, the prior term. Um, and I think um, also looking at, you know, probably more uh, focus on co-investments where, uh, you know, parties are broadly looking to, to de-risk opportunities um, as, as private capital reduced, so sharing, sharing risk. So I think, you know, a few, a few sort of comments to set the scene there before we, we dive into um, to some of those points later. Perfect. Uh, Albert, maybe uh, some things to uh, add? Uh? Yeah, uh, so I, I think we're, you know, to state the obvious, we're living through incredible times and this is an event that really hasn't, we haven't seen the likes of this for, you know, decades and decades. I think there's going to be a very, very large range of outcomes here. Um, so there's obviously some businesses um, that are, have benefited quite a lot, unfortunately, from, from the current status quo. And I think we should all kind of pause and, and, um, and kind of recognise the human suffering that unfortunately this is going to create with, I think, around 16 million Americans uh, filing for unemployment insurance in the last couple of weeks. Um, obviously, that, that's really, really bad for a lot of households, and, and that's a huge shame. Uh, but, you know, the reality is that for a, a lot of businesses, there are some positives here. Um, and so there's a huge range of outcomes. There's a lot of sectors where this is an event that has basically rejigged the field a little and allowed some who've been able to move more quickly in taking advantage of this to kind of gain market share at the expense of, of maybe others. Um, obviously, you know, everyone here will, will be very, very aware that there's some sectors that are going to struggle for, for probably months to come. So companies in the travel experiences, um, live entertainment, sports, they, you know, those kinds of spaces have obviously been significantly impacted. And I think for those businesses, the length of full shutdown um, and consequently the amount of cash burn they're going to sustain is a really, really critical variable. Um, and you know, they're, they're obviously in a tough spot. And then on the other hand, this is gonna accelerate a lot of existing trends 
Uh, so for example, we're lucky enough to be an investor in Alt Zero, which is an authentication identity company that, that is, um, is very API driven. And so for them, the, the trend for more and more people having to work from home is, is probably a positive. Um, similarly with, um, you know, we're an investor in a company called Team Solo Mid, which is the largest esports league in the world, um, and also Skills, which powers mobile gaming uh, tournaments. So for companies like that, you know, there's more and more people spending their free time with online gaming, so they, they probably see tailwinds. Um, I do think overall that private funding rounds will, will become much more challenging to close. And, um, you know, there's some businesses that in any market they're going to be able to raise. Like there, there's some, you know, we all know that there's some phenomenal businesses that, that will be founded during this time and will grow out of this period. Um, but for a lot of others, it's going to be a harder time. So I think it's a, it's a time where, you know, we're, we're all going to get through it, but we, you know, it's going to be really, really challenging. Um, so, to, you know, really, you know, trying to work through and, and survival becomes really, really key. Um, you know, I, I do also have to comment that I, I felt as an investor um, in kind of mid to late stage rounds in technology for the last couple of years, valuations have been, you know, extremely frothy. I think most people here will, will be aware of this. Um, and, um, you know, if you're a company that's doing quite well, you know, you, you've really been a, a price giver uh, to the VCs and you've been able to raise basically any amount of capital. And I think that that trend will, will change. Um, and, you know, possibly it, it was probably a, a little bit overdue um, given there were some companies that raised billions of dollars and, and actually didn't have a sound economic model. Thank you. And maybe um, your view, Michael, from, uh, I know Albert and uh, Robert are also uh, working with um, Asia, Southeast Asia, etc. But your view from uh, Singapore, Michael? Um, I think uh, this is obviously uh, a dramatic, as, as the, everybody's already said, it has, this has never really been seen before. You know, even if you look at the financial crisis of um, 2007 eight, it, it was very much focused more on the developed countries than it was on the under, underdeveloped countries in, in many ways. And, and it was very much also focused on, on uh, around the US. Here, this is a global, something which is global. Also, never has there been such travel restriction based on so many people. Um, so, the lack of the ability to, to move around, and it's actually affecting every part of society as we know it. Um, and the, the big unknown, and I know what a lot of, uh, I've talked to a lot of my colleagues in the VC market and, you know, a lot of founders is how long is this going to last for? Nobody really knows. It's very hard to make a plan if you don't know if this is going to last three months, six months, 12 months, just on the, the extreme side of it before it all starts opening up, uh, opening up again. I think for me, uh, where it's affecting Southeast Asia is we're a Southeast Asian fund. So last year alone, we did deals in Myanmar, Vietnam, Indonesia, Philippines, um, and Thailand. And we're dealing with, uh, I work at the very early stage. So the majority of the people that I'm, uh, founders I'm talking to are first time founders who, you know, have never raised funding before. So the information that they've got, they can put in a deck and they can send through quite often isn't really suitable. Um, so I'm having, uh, you know, and I can't look at data points to make an investment to see if this company is any good. Um, so I rely very heavily, and I know a lot of early stage investors very much rely on meeting and spending time with the founders. Um, and in, uh, with the travel restrictions, that's made incredibly difficult, different, uh, difficult to do. So I can't go and I can't see, spend time with, uh, with them, get to know the founders. Um, and, you know, uh, I think, you know, where the other money is coming from, from is from angel investors. And pretty much angel investing has come to a grinding halt. Um, so that's going to affect the fundraising capability of a lot of the early stage companies. And also the other issue for Southeast Asia is all the money is pulled into two places. It's all in Singapore and Jakarta a little bit, but it's mostly all in Singapore. So uh, a lot of the uh, founders rely on being able to come to Singapore on the whole um, to meet uh, the VCs at some point in time during the process. I don't think VCs would be ever comfortable, especially at the early stage, investing in founders they've never actually met in person. Um, so I think all of these things are gonna make it very interesting 
uh, going forward. And, and just as what was just mentioned in terms of valuations, um, I'm already seeing companies uh, I call it the COVID-19 discount. Uh, it, it, there's like a 30, 40% drop uh, in valuations for early stage companies now. Um, and, you know, one of the areas which is very much being affected, it's not just in new deals, it's those companies that are um, uh, kind of doing the bridge rounds, like I'll call maybe the pre-series A, if you don't like the word bridge. Um, they haven't quite hit their targets. They're going out, they've raised the money that they're still working on their product market fits. They haven't really hit the traction to get to series A, um, but they've built out their team. They've got, they, 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 you know, uh, they, they, they're burning through cash. Um, those are the, the companies that I think are being severely uh, affected at this point in time, because it's, unless you can uh, raise money from your current investors, it's very hard to, to meet new investors um, on that stage. So I'm actually seeing quite a devastating effect um, already. Um, in the early stage uh, market for, um, in Southeast Asia. And maybe to jump a bit on that, um, so we have uh, some uh, participants, some attendees from uh, these uh, emerging markets in uh, SEA. Uh, we have guys from uh, Vietnam, Myanmar, Cambodia, uh, Singapore, obviously. Um, in your uh, daily uh, routine or work as a, an investor, how this situation is changing your way uh, of working, like in the due diligence process, etc. Um, I think in the due diligence, um, we, uh, I think, as I said, that the, the, the person to person side of it is, yeah. is, is uh, the, the kind of face to face side um, is obviously being severely disrupted. Um, the rest of it was we all did pretty much online anyway. Um, so it hasn't really changed that. It's very much getting to know the founders uh, as much as possible, meeting up with them, getting to them on a personal level, uh, really understanding. Because as I said, most, most of the founders we're seeing in the region here are on the whole first time founders. Um, they don't have a track record. You know, you don't, you know, when I was in the UK or the US, you know, we were seeing serial entrepreneurs. So there's some history you can go back and look on. You know, the average age is probably around 25, 30 for a lot of our founders in our portfolio. Um, so, you know, they, they've even got the uh, interesting aspect of none of them have actually gone through a downturn. So, they, you know, so in terms of even how to manage this, a lot of them are, are struggling with. But in terms of the due diligence, absolutely uh, not an issue at all, um, it, apart from the, the face-to-face side of it. But it, it does affect it. And it's, I think it affects it more in terms of where my time is. And uh, I'm spending a lot of time now supporting my current portfolio. So, um, you know, and I've talked to, again, a number of investors. And at the moment, um, probably, I would say for about another month, um, a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, VCs are just making sure that their current portfolio um, is, is okay. They're putting the right actions in place to deal with the situation, uh, um, that they're properly funded um, to survive. And we're, we're telling our companies to try and get to make sure they've got funding that will last to the end of quarter two next year. Okay. Um, that that's our view on it, but, um, but we're still doing new deals. We've done a couple of new term sheets over the last few weeks, but they were companies that we had met the founders before this all, all blew up. So new deals based on people you've seen before the outbreak. Uh, yeah. and now you're just yeah. doing the due diligence, but not going on to new deals. Yeah. Not going on to new deals with people yeah. you've not met, basically. Yeah, um, I, I think we will. Um, yeah. But it's at this point in time, it, it, we, it, because of the uncertainty, we just want to make sure that portfolio, I mean, as a fund, we're quite strange. We don't actually have a management fee. We only get, uh, we only make money on based on success. So uh, very much uh, our focus is on that. And if you look at a lot of VCs, the ability to raise their next fund is based on uh, the performance of their first fund. So a lot of them are also making sure that portfolio where they put their money already is probably the most important thing. And I think a lot of VCs are just sitting and waiting. Uh, um, I was on a VC call last night with um, six prominent uh, Singapore VCs. And, and pretty much as we, we, we can afford to wait a few months and not make any new investments, just to hopefully have a bit more clarity uh, moving forward in terms of how long this is all going to last. Yeah. Maybe, uh, Robert, if you can add uh, uh, your thoughts on, uh, on this, how's your uh, daily uh, 
work uh, going now that you can't travel. I know you have a big presence as well in uh, Asia with Artesian. Um, how are you coping with, uh, with that and how it changed your uh, daily routine? Yeah, I guess, I guess from my perspective, my, my primary focus is, is on Australia at the moment. Um, so uh, domestic travel certainly um, impacted and, and look, it's an, it's an adjustment. I think um, it's one that's been, you know, relatively seamless when you consider, um, you know, how we we're working previously and, and, you know, what we needed to do to, um, to get to where we are now um, with, uh, with the online platforms that, that we're already, um, you know, well, well versed with. I think um, just sort of echoing um, one of Michael's points previously, um, you know, not having the ability to, uh, engage you know in a face-to-face -face context with with founders with portfolio companies you know certainly presents a challenge because the way you know we look at it is um, you know potential you know and an investment is, is potentially a, a circa 10-year type relationship and you know a really big part of it is uh, you know getting to know each other developing you know a sense of trust and accountability and um, you know, taking away from the fact that it's, yeah, it's, 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 it's hard, uh, it's harder, you know, when you aren't meeting face to face. Um, I think, you know, just having the ability to incorporate some of those personal uh, elements into the, the DD process is probably helpful now um, just to try and, you know, round out, um, you know, that, that overall assessment. But I think, um, I think from a, a practical, um, you know, deal flow management, uh, existing portfolio company engagement perspective. Um, you know, we're, we're lucky that we're in an industry that um, you know is is well adjusted to to these these ways of online working. So I, I'd say overall the the impact has been um, you know relatively minimal, and it's just uh, you know looking to you know augment um, you know some of the uh, opportunities that the physical piece um, you know used to provide into into you know our, our new normal. And, uh, and you, Albert, thank you, uh, Robert. Yeah, I mean, the other thing I'll, I'll also add um, that, that m m some people may not actually know is that um, the VC business model generally involves both management and performance fees. Um, so as Michael said, you, you know, the, the, their firm sounds a little unusual and um, highly aligned, more aligned with LPs than most, but most charge a management fee uh, plus a performance fee or carry structure. Uh, where you get a share of the profits and um, and so for most uh, businesses like ours our revenue is actually not impacted um, so we're actually on the on the lucky spectrum and our work is is extremely kind of digital first um, so I, I um, as, as an investor actively investing in both the US and Australia you know I've been doing zoom calls for months and months and months um, so that hasn't changed uh, what is a pretty big impact for me personally is the, you know, I, I spend a lot of time in San Francisco, which I obviously can't do um, now. So that's obviously much harder. Uh, we've announced two new investments. Uh, or we've closed two new investments uh, recently and um, closed a third that is not yet announced. Um, but in all, all those cases, so we invested in, in Rancher, um, a um, Kubernetes multi-cloud management company, and also in um, subspace, which helps manage latency for gamers. Um, and so in, in all three cases, we already knew the founders before COVID. So we haven't yet had to deal with a, a um, kind of no physical contact um, situation yet. Um, I do think we're a little bit um, lucky because we tend to invest in proven companies with uh, kind of at least a couple of mil of revenue. So very clearly post product market fear. So um, whilst the people side is extremely important and like it's absolutely critical, it's, it's truly a 10 year marriage, um, you know, we at least do have the benefit of, of having you know, numbers and, and customers and you can still do customer calls, you can still go and try a lot of digital products yourself, for example. Um, so from that perspective, I think our, our, um, our market is a little bit less affected. Um, I see that one of the questions was around valuation. So, yeah, yeah. you know, I, I personally feel that um, the market is a little bit frozen right now because there's a, a lot of companies that raised last year at really quite frothy valuations. I, I was speaking to a founder um, who I obviously won't, won't name, but he raised money at 150 mil post money valuation last year without any revenue. 
and now he's surprisingly raising again. And you know, it, it, it just, I really don't know what happens to a business like that, like how you can actually close the next round when there hasn't been the huge growth in revenue and you raise it at such an astronomical valuation. Um, so yeah, we are seeing a, a material drop. So founders are moving from, you know, expecting kind of, you know, for a typical SaaS company going from 10 to 16 X ARR to kind of, I'd probably say a 30% drop at, at least. Um, you know, but it, it really depends on the situation. There are some quality companies that are a bit down on their luck with COVID and they're probably not as impacted. Um, and then there's a whole range of companies that have had a really material impact. And, you know, that's, that's just hard. And I think the, the existing investors really need to step up to help them survive. Um, do you feel it's, and do you feel it's more on the, emerge, on the early stage uh, startups that the drop is uh, higher or? Uh, no, it, 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 I mean, one, one VC told me that the good thing about his portfolio is that there wasn't any revenue impact for his companies because none of his companies had any revenue yet. That's a good one. So, um, so I, I, um, I, I think that, I mean, it, it really just depends on the company and its circumstance. Like, can you work from home with your, your current setup? Do you need a lot of physical contact with, with the business to get, get the job done? You know, are your contact centers now all closed so you can't have service customers? I mean, questions like that are quite, uh, so questions that go to the operational complexity of, of a business um, are, are the really important questions. Um, and so, so it just really depends. And as I've said, there are some that have seen massive tailwinds from this. Um, so Zoom, Zoom is a listed company being the obvious beneficiary. And by the way, the ticker is ZM, not ZOOM, in case you're buying the wrong stock. Um, and, um, and so, yeah, so we, we are, you know, as, as, as Michael said previously, you know, we're very heavily involved in triaging with our portfolio. So we've been really, really focused on that, which obviously reduces the amount of time for new deals, uh, but essentially working with our founders, especially those that have been more affected to help them survive. And so that's involved a lot of, you know, really difficult conversations around cost cutting, you know, removing um, roles, um, maybe moving to lots of different structures. I mean, I think we'll probably talk about this in a bit more, more time, but, you know, there's been a huge human element to that that's been quite challenging to work through. Um, I do also see a lot of opportunity, um, unfortunately. You know, it's, it's, as a capitalist, it's probably not a great thing to admit on a call like this, but, um, you know, I, I think there's, there's very clearly some really great companies long-term and you know, potentially you might in, be able to invest in a great company now that, that maybe in the past had 100 VCs chasing them. I mean, by definition, when, you know, when 86 of those VCs are not actively investing in new companies, um, you know, maybe, maybe there is some real opportunity there. So, so part of that kind of interests me, but you know, it, it is a, a very risky time. Um, and you, know, you, you really need to have a lot of vision to kind of make a, a large investment in a new company you haven't met face to face. Yeah, thank you. I, I also wanted to add, like one of the other risks that we probably haven't covered is, um, given I haven't left the house in four weeks, there's also a higher risk of us all going mad. Yes, yeah. yeah, that's for sure, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, lots of uh, things will be happening again. And on that, um, maybe let's switch to, uh, to um, Michael. What's your view on, um, the funding scene after the COVID-19, like, uh, do you think it will change it uh, uh, for a long time or it will be recovering about after some months or? Uh... I, I think we'll, uh, I'll talk, uh, but I'll just talk very much about the early stage. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Kind of like the, the, around the seed stage. Um, I, I think it's going to have a knock-on effect. Um, if you look at, um, we spent a lot of time talking about uh, um, fundraising for startups. We also got to look about fundraising for VCs as well. Um, luckily, we just closed our fund um, uh, late last year. So we've got a fund now for the next five years. But there's a lot of uh, early stage funds in the region that are coming up to the, or, or within the last year of their, of their fund. So they were going out fundraising now. Um, and I think there was an article about, about, about 100 VCs that were, out actively fundraising um, themselves for their new fund. Um, uh, pretty much across the board of everybody I've talked to, um, that's come to a grinding halt. Um, just but like we like investing in people, LPs, especially if they're writing big checks, actually like to meet people face to face and have, have the, the GPs fly out and meet them. 
So um, I think there's going to be uh, less VCs around uh, next year. And I think also those that do, even when they go, go out, if they're here, evaluate, you know, as I said, for VCs to raise their next fund, they look at the current value of their portfolio and the success of that to be able to get new money to come in. And I think it's going to take a while for a lot of the companies and a lot of the portfolios um, to recover. Um, I, I think a lot of people in Asia that were angel investing were, um, were using that what we call discretionary money. Um, they're now not using that discretionary, they're using that discretionary money to actually survive. Um, so I think their spending power is going to be uh, affected um, uh, for, for probably the near term. Um, and I think, um, you, you know, uh, there's not going to be as many exits because obviously this is not just about investing in companies, it's about getting returns as well. So I think there's going to be a gap of probably like a, a year to two years um, before you start seeing any major exits. I think there'll be some M&A, but I don't think there'll, there'll necessarily be the good M&A stuff um, that's going on. So I do think it, it is going to uh, affect uh, massively uh, for the next 12 to 24 months, uh, the early stage investing. Um, it, will, it will come back again. I mean, uh, there's definitely, I think people are turning the corner now. I do a lot of enterprise, so businesses. A lot of my companies are actually doing relatively well because uh, uh, SMEs and corporates are like, we need to be more efficient. We need to bring in, it's actually pushing them towards technology. So I think the adoption rate is actually going, going to increase. And where investors see success, they'll want to follow that and put their money into it. So um, I think in the long term, that this is, in a twisted way, this will actually be a benefit. I think if you're on the consumer spending side, and that's the certain sectors, you know, like food delivery and such like, which aren't being affected, uh, which is positive, but a lot of consumer stuff in the hospitality um, businesses and travel businesses, I think they're gonna, there's going to be a lock on, uh, knock on effect a, a lot, uh, a lot further down, down the line. But so on the investing side, I think governments are going to have to step in. I mean, the Singapore government has, has been uh, very supportive. Um, not many of the other governments around the regions yet have actually come up with a clear plan in terms of how they're going to support the, 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 the industries. But um, I think it will come back. But I think the recovery in the US and the UK is going to be a lot faster um, than it is going to be in Southeast Asia because there's a smaller pot of money um, to go for. But if you're a good, or what I would say, if you're a good company, you're always going to be able to raise money no matter what the situation is out there. Uh, VCs might be more selective, but they have to invest the money. Um, we can't just sit here for, and say we're not going to do anything for the next two years until things get better. Um, and in many ways, you know, because valuations become more realistic, it's actually a good time to be investing. I've gone through two downturns before, and I would say my best performing companies have actually been ones that I've invested in uh, during when times have been bad in, 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 the, in you know, the greater universe. Because I'm talking from space, I'll talk it that way. Um, so... Uh, for me, it's, uh, I might sound all doom and gloom, but the, the thing is, is that people will still be investing. I think you've just got to make sure when you're talking to investors, if you get a chance to talk to investors, you really spend time and make sure you get it right, personalize it. You know, uh, I get so many what I would call spam emails, which is obviously just emails. They've sent the same email out to like 30 funds. And, you know, beforehand, people would have maybe responded to them. Now, I think it would be much more selective. So you, you've got to actually spend a bit more time getting to know the VCs before you actually send it and personalize and, and try and make the VCs, you know, stand out to the VCs. Yes. And, and let's all be honest. I mean, if, you, if you're a SaaS, enterprise SaaS company and you raise it 10 times ARR rather than 16 times, that's still a phenomenal valuation in the, in the history of the world. Like, it's still a very good... I mean, it feels like a dramatic drop, but I mean, overall interest rates are still ultra low and the valuations, the, the amount of money in the market means that valuations are still very high in the scheme of things. Um, it's just they're a little bit less high than they were um, a few months ago. Yeah. And maybe Robert, your uh, view on the, um, after uh, the outbreak uh, situation, uh, so maybe for more later stage uh, startups and uh, investing and in Australia, 
Yeah, well, I think, I think just to start, I just wanted to echo a couple of the points um, that Michael and Albert made earlier. Um, so firstly, you know, Michael was talking about the fact that, you know, good companies are regardless through this and, you know, absolutely concur. Um, and I think, you know, one of the, the pieces to, uh, you know, identify there is that I guess, you know, good, good companies and founders really understand, you know, the, the challenging nature of the situation and um, the response that's required and the engagement that's re required with investors in order to, um, you know, ultimately get them comfortable. And I think, you know, potentially we might talk about this a little bit more in a moment, but, um, but, but, but that's, that's, a, that's a really key, um, key part of this. The other thing that, that Albert mentioned as well is, you know, around the, the opportunity point, um, yes, you know, with, you know, restrictions around accessing private capital, um, we certainly feel that there is, you know, going to be an opportunity for us, you know, to play um, an enhanced role in, uh, you know, leading and, and anchoring um, transactions, particularly where, where those uh, opportunities are really core to, you know, our, our particular mandates. Um, and we're, we're already seeing a number of examples where, you know, we're, we're working to do that via term sheets, you know, through, through this environment. So I think, um, I think that, that is, you know, a key um, aspect as to, you know, how investors are, are thinking. But I think when we sort of consider, you know, some of the, the broader um, implications and outlook, um, you know, with regard to the, the global VC and funding landscape from here, a number of these have been touched on um, already. I think, you know, we've, we've talked about the fact that there is um, naturally going to be stricter funding criteria, um, you know, as a result of the economic uncertainty, which means that, you know, uh, founders and companies are, are going to be strict as investors look to uh, protect and preserve capital. Uh, we've talked about, you know, the impact of valuation. Again, it's, it's, been, it's been somewhat unusual in this case in that instead of, you know, lagging uh, public markets to an, ascent, to an extent, the impact has been relatively immediate. Um, and, you know, one of the questions that came through in the, in the chat comments um, was around, you know, what, what we're seeing. And, you know, depending on the, the sector, the stage, the, you know, the, the business model, we're, we're seeing valuation impacts of between 30 to 70%. And, you know, it's worth noting um, as part of that, there are certain, you know, sectors, um, you know, where transactions won't be taking place for, you know, the, the next little bit. So um, it's, it's really, you know, taking that into account. I think a few other things that, that we're expecting to see, um, probably smaller funding rounds. Um, so, you know, as companies required to, you know, satisfy stricter funding criteria, I think we're probably going to expect to see investors reduce the amount of funds they're committing to, um, to those opportunities. And the other thing that, you know, that um, can be expected as well is probably um, changes and amendments to investment structures. Um, so as, you know, as investors, you know, seek to um, minimise, you know, risk and, and protect against downside risk, um, you know, as this scenario um, continues to play out, um, you know, probably going to see a shift away from sort of, you know, straight equity deals to alternative structures like, um, convertible notes, preferred equity, et cetera. So um, I think, you know, that there is, there is going to be a change um, in terms of, uh, you know, what transactions are done and how they're done. But um, going back to that, that you know, initial comment, um, you know, the, the, the great uh, companies, opportunities, founders, you know, are, are going to have the opportunity to, to get funded through this. And it's really just working with investors to, you know, to find a way to, um, you know, to, to, to manage the opportunity. Thank you. Uh, maybe Albert, uh, I guess you're uh, aware of all of this, but you could jump a bit on the, uh, we spoke about the government implications uh, within startups uh, with the outbreak. Um, how is it about in Australia? And maybe if you have a, an overview of uh, in the US as well. Um, yeah, sure. So uh, our companies are each 
seeing whether the government programs that have launched are applicable to them. So people will be aware in Australia, there's JobKeeper, for example. And um, and so I, I understand that initially when that was launched, it, it required a 30% decline um, year on year, I think, in or, or month on month in, in the amount of business. So if you're a startup that was still growing, but but quite, he quite heavily impacted, but still growing, you, you didn't qualify. I think that's now changed. And so that, that enables a payment from the government um, for up to six months. So obviously that's really welcome relief and it basically directly means there's less job cuts that are necessary. Um, so, you know, each of our companies has been really closely working out the details. Some of them have had to apply to the Australian tax office or, or other bodies to see, you know, just confirm that it actually applies to them. But that, I mean, to state the obvious, that's life-saving cash for a lot of businesses that have been impacted. Um, and then in, in the US, I mean, people will probably be aware there's a, a, a government program there and there's been a lot of debate on whether it applies or not. Um, you know, we, we've been supporting our companies. We've been really actively encouraging them to, to if they are applicable, you know, to, to, to get the benefit of them. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, the, that money is a small piece of the overall cash management um, kind of planning that the companies have to do. So each company that we're working with is working out, you know, what, what is their, you know, everything is about the cash cash flow statement now. Previously, people were, were throwing around P&L or adjusted, adjusted kind of pro forma numbers, but now it's just all cash. So cash is king and cash is what matters. And so every company is looking at um, with their cash, you know, what's the revenue delta, what, what's the delta in cash inflows than what you were experienced before? How can you offset that cost? Like how many... You know, if, the, if it's making roles redundant, you know, what's the long-term impact of that lower cost structure? What are the additional redundancy payments? You know, how can you save money? Is it, is it transitioning your office to a WeWork? I mean, so every company is really going through every mechanism they can to conserve cash and, and survive and, and be well positioned, hopefully when this ends. Um, and, you know, the government um, kind of support has been welcome and, and but a, a piece of a much larger puzzle to solve. Yes, thank you. And maybe uh, Michael, the situation with the government, so you, you told us a bit in, um, in Singapore, but in the other countries in uh, Southeast Asia, I know it's not that uh, easy, but uh, what have you seen so far? To be quite honest, I've seen very little. Um, you know, outside of Singapore, um, who is you know, a very targeted support for startups. So they're paying uh, up to 80% uh, of salaries, but only of locals, so not of foreigners. So that they're very focused on supporting uh, local employees, not, not, so it's just not anybody that works in a startup. If you're here on a, an employment pass, then you're excluded from the support, which does cause a few issues because obviously um, if you've got to make salary cuts, you some that it kind of uh, incentivizes you to keep the locals and get rid of the uh, foreigners. And I know that sometimes founders have had to make that difficult uh, decision. Um, you know, in the companies that I've got uh, across the region, like the Philippines, nothing has been announced yet. Um, so in Indonesia, nothing really much has been you know Myanmar so th these companies have been very much left on their own devices I mean the reality is a lot of the time their overheads are not huge anyway salaries are a lot less um, you know the, the rent is not huge so you know um, the most of the discussions have been just kind of reducing salaries across the board uh, you know getting rid of their office um, but also at, at the stage that we're at in terms of most of the companies being early stage, they haven't got a huge cash burn anyway. They're still finding product market fit. So a lot of people are very much focused on, you know, how can we adapt to the, uh, to the new environment and still gain growth? So I would say probably for, uh, not, you know, about half our portfolio, there's been a stall in sales uh, kind of like for the last month, month and a half. But a lot of them have now come up with new strategies, which they believe either tinkering with their products or doing a new approach to sales. Um, actually, one of our companies, which was very much Singapore focused, uh, you know, uh, for the whole of last year, now has got sales in six countries around the world. And it's got another like customers coming in from another four, 
countries just adapted their, their marketing and actually now rather than selling the whole suite there's one particular part of their product which is really saving a huge amount of money for a lot of uh, their customers so they're just focusing on that one part doing everything online you know where beforehand they required face-to-face -face meetings to close a deal they can now do that literally all, all through a 15 minutes uh, zoom call they've made it very simple so I think a lot of it is uh, you, you know the great thing about entrepreneurs when they're pushed against the wall the good ones will always figure out ways of finding the silver lining uh, in the opportunity um, and actually being able to work very quickly especially as they're still small so they're still very nimble they can uh, they can afford to do that going back to my earlier comment the companies that have moved up and are, have raised money but still haven't quite got the product market fit I think those are the ones that are, are, are finding it harder to adapt because it's the biggest shift they've got to try and figure out and turn um, but and I don't think many of the founders across the region are looking or expecting, to be quite honest, to get much um, support from the government. Um, so I, I think that they're used to being left on their own and doing that. And we're helping them as much as we possibly can get through this. And we're spending a lot of time getting actually founders from across our portfolio to actually work together and see what resources they can share. Um, so we've got a couple of... Uh, our port, one of our portfolio had, had a few extra developers that were going to let go. Instead, everybody's chipping in and they, different portfolio companies are using those developers at a cheaper rate to actually get some product uh, changes they needed done uh, quickly. So I think that's, that's the way. It's trying to get people to work together. And there's a lot of VCs. I don't know about Australia, but across the region in, in Singapore, a lot of the VCs have come together and are setting up different programs to actually support um, early stage startups. So it's very much a, a community-based support more than a government-based support. Thanks. And what you would be, uh, Albert and uh, Robert, your uh, uh, tips and advice for uh, maybe early stage and uh, later stage startups in, uh, in Australia or outside of Australia as well um, to go through this? Um, so my, I mean, my advice is probably pretty general, you know, as I, as I said earlier, cash is king. I, I would be um, extremely focused on cash burn and, you know, what, what's really essential versus a nice to have. Um, so, you know, can you, can you, um, you know, do a cash for equity scheme where you can reduce salaries by people taking on more equity, for example, can you, have some roles more part-time? Can you reduce salaries overall if people are happy to do so? Um, you know, can you, um, you know, we've seen some CEO founders of, of companies forego bonuses or bonuses plus pay, which is obviously quite, quite extreme, but in some cases they feel warranted. Um, so it, it's just been a, a real focus on, on cash management and just reducing the burn. Um, you know, it, um, I think it, it, people are moving more and more towards the core and towards where this, the unit economics are. So, you know, we've seen companies that previously were, were doing business that grew their revenues, but that was at a low contribution margin to the, to the overall business for, for different reasons. And I'd say that activity, you know, it's a good idea to, to really understand the contribution margin. Um, and the unit economics of, of what you do in, in each part of your business. And I, I'd say there's a, a lot of startups that are probably making ultimately the right longer term call, which is doing less activities that are not immediately viable um, and just being more focused on if they can getting paid cash earlier or, or even upfront, um, you know, working with their larger customers in the case of enterprise to see if there's any potential for the enterprises to be more forthcoming with with the cash payments earlier because obviously that has a huge impact um, so it's it's just been a, a really really deep dive on on every element of that and um, and then also um, on the on the funding side you know we, we've talked at length about the challenges I'd say that it's a good time to engage with VCs that have expressed some interest in your business especially those you've met in person before but maybe haven't been in touch with recently um, I'd say it's also a good time to um, you know, I, I'm, I'm not a fan at all of like emailing every VC and hoping someone replies, but if there are some VCs that reach out to you and have a targeted interest in you and your business, I'd say it's a, that's a good category because at least they show some interest in, in the business. 
um, and maybe they are they are more open to making an investment, a new investment, without um, knowing you. Um, I think it's a good time to really um, engage your um, your investors as well, especially if you want them to write another check. Um, if you're engaging with them, if you're um, kind of communicating with them the, the risks, the challenges, the opportunities, um, and what you're doing in response, I'd say that's a very good idea. And ultimately, we're doing the same thing with our LPs. So we're communicating with our LPs what the what the risks are in our portfolio, who's impacted, what the impact is likely to do. Um, we've actually gone through the entire portfolio for every single company and um, and basically got to a an adjusted plan post COVID and understood their future financing needs. And then we've communicated what we felt would be the impact to our LPs. Um, and so, uh, you know, they're basically our stakeholder. And so if, uh, from a founder perspective, doing that with your existing investors is probably a good idea. And, um, you know, the more you build a strong relationship, um, if there's capacity or potential, they'll, they'll write another check. Um, I'd say overall in Australia as well. So, um, you know, there's, there's been a few different trends um, in Australia that have been slower to actually um, erupt. So one of those is telehealth, for example. So people have talked about telehealth for a long time, but it just hasn't happened yet. Um, and COVID has been a huge accelerator for telehealth in Australia. So we, we're an investor in Health Engine, which is Australia's largest consumer health appointments marketplace. And they've actually launched a, health, a, a telehealth product um, where you can you can have a telehealth consultation with your existing GP um, or other other practitioner, and it's all integrated within their existing practice, practice management software from the from the their side, and it facilitates payment. So that makes it very convenient. And in the past, that that wasn't um, government subsidised, but now it actually is. So the government has rushed to to pass legislation to actually make it bulk billable, so you don't pay out of pocket for that. And so we've seen big tailwinds and growth. Um, in, trend, in, in areas like that that have just been slow to react because they haven't had a real impetus. Thanks. Um, and maybe, uh, Robert, your um, uh, tips and advice for uh, startups as well, maybe as well more on the Australian side. Yeah, I think, I think um, you know, from a, from a trading perspective in particular and... Um, you know, as other said, from a stakeholder management perspective, I think something really key for companies engaging with uh, their existing investors or prospective investors that are doing due diligence um, currently is, you know, number one, ensuring that they, you know, have a clear understanding of the extremely challenging and wide ranging um, nature of this situation and, and being able to recognise that and communicate um, that there is an awareness to that because I think, I think, uh, investors across the board, you know, need to see that in this environment. Um, and then with that in mind, um, you know, and, and this applies again to, you know, existing investors or, or prospective investors, you know, companies um, need to be able to demonstrate that they've considered how their business can be impacted through this. So, you know, identifying, um, you know, the, the key areas of impact and then at the same time, you know, recognising what actions they can take to, um, not only mitigate um, the risks that have been identified, but also um, potentially um, recognise, you know, opportunities that are coming through this. And I, I think this piece is going to be really, really important for companies that are engaged in due diligence currently, um, because I'd expect that, that nearly all investors, you know, would want to spend a meaningful amount of time to, to really dive in and, um, you know, just get a sense that, that, you know, this environment has been taken into account um, with respect of, uh, you know, perhaps previous funding plans that were on the table um, before the, you know, the onset of, of this pandemic. And, you know, where that was the case, you know, how are those plans now being adjusted to account for the impact? So, you know, uh, it could be, could be a case um, that, uh, you know, either, you know, uh, runway needs to be extended or managed um, as a result of the impact of trading environment, you know, sales impact is going to mean that, you know, the, the plan looks different. So I think, um, I think companies really need to be prepared to engage deeply um, around that. And I think that's going to lead to a more, you know, more um, meaningful and, and um, likely chance of a successful um, you know, outcome with, with the investors. Thank you, guys. 
Thanks, Albert, Michael, and uh, Robert for these uh, answers, these uh, insights, etc. The good thing I see with uh, online uh, events for us is that uh, at least uh, we are on time, so we don't lose time uh, gathering everyone, having a beer or a glass of wine, <laughs> trying to get uh, ready uh, to hear the speakers. So we made it 11 sharp to 12 one. Thanks again, guys. Um, and uh, so next week we'll host uh, an event same time uh, with Zoom webinar as well with uh, female founders uh, only uh, from Australia and uh, APAC region. And the week after, so this one next week will be hosted by uh, Leo, my co-founder. And uh, the week after we host an event dedicated on uh, emerging markets. So of course we will uh, each time speak about the situation, but also speak about uh, uh, what uh, these guys are doing, etc. Uh, as a business, as, as entrepreneurs. So thanks again for uh, joining us. Lots of questions, lots of uh, answers. Feel free to register to our um, Startup and Angels online community with uh, Ramen Life. And uh, thank you. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everyone. Good luck and look after yourselves. <laughs> and stay home. Uh, stay safe. Thanks a lot. All the best. Thanks. Thanks, everyone.